The enemy will always try to attack the last thing God said to you. He can't change who you are. He can just alter your confidence in who you are. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. You, well, I love you too. You are unusually nice. Thank you. Um, by the way, Benny had uh, the best week she's had in quite a while this last week. So, yeah, really thankful. Very, very thankful. I do appreciate your prayer so much. <clears throat> Laughing at your own mistakes lengthens your life. Laughing at your wife's mistakes shortens it. <laughs> Which reminds me of another one that I read years ago. It said, uh, a study has been done and they found that women who add a few extra pounds live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> Which brings us to the next one. Behind every husband who thinks he wears the pants is a wife who told him which pants to wear. <laughs> I was lonely until I glued a coffee cup to the top of my car. Now everyone waves at me. Pennsylvania man is suing Smart Water. It's a brand, Smart Water, for not making him smart. <laughs> I'd like to formally announce my lawsuit against Thin Mints. <laughs> one more, one more. <clears throat> I met a woman outside the mall crying. She had just lost two, $200. So I gave her $40 from the 200 I found. <laughs> When God blesses you, you have to bless others. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, that's, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> I have more if, if, if the message doesn't go well. I, I, I saved them. So why don't you open your Bibles? I'm going to have you open to two portions, and then I'm going to read from a third. Okay, um, I, I want you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 3 and Luke chapter 4, okay? Genesis 3 and Luke 4. <clears throat> and then I'm going to read to you from uh, Romans chapter 5, so... Here's what I want to do today. <clears throat> you can tell what the enemy fears about your life by recognizing what he attacks. The enemy lives in reaction to realities. And when he recognizes something that he fears you discovering, he attacks. Sometimes his attacks are very overt, very um, extreme. We see it in tragedy, crisis, difficulty, affliction, those kinds of things. But the most common attack of the enemy are his questions. Now, the Lord is not a, at all afraid of questions. He's, he's pretty secure, fairly intelligent. It's not that questions are bad. It's just that whenever the enemy gets you to ask his question, it's always to lead to deception and unbelief. 
Deception, rarely because at least he doesn't start with an out and out lie. He starts with the distortion of something that's real. When the Lord asks a question, it's always to bring you into understanding and greater faith. The two stories we're going to look at is one is from the first Adam, which is Genesis 3, and Luke 4, we're going to look at the last Adam. We don't call Jesus the second Adam because there isn't going to be a third. He's the last Adam. He literally is the firstborn of the dead. Now, he's not the first person raised from the dead, but he was the firstborn from the dead because in his resurrection is the template or the power or the mandate to raise up an entire new generation of people. Everyone born again is a new creation, something that has never existed before. The first failure or the failure that we see of Adam and Eve happened in the Garden of Eden, a place of absolute perfect beauty, absolute perfect abundance. The last Adam, instead of failure, we see success, breakthrough, was in a wilderness with a devil. You can become more culturally aware of important things if you just stop to recognize what the enemy is targeting. I don't mean he sets the pace. I don't mean he shows us what's important. We just learn what does he fear? What does he fear in this individual, in this family? Because he only attacks what is a threat to him. You'll notice in the Old Testament, in the story of Israel, in their journey from Egypt, eventually into the promised land, and then into taking over the land that God had given them as an inheritance, they would be attacked by an enemy nation whenever they were close to another victory. As I heard somebody say recently, Israel would find themselves being attacked by an enemy nation whenever they were close to another victory. So the implication is when you are under attack for whatever reason, under attack of the enemy, it's only because you are a threat to him and you're close to another victory. What he does in his attempts to target our life is to get us to turn inward instead of upward. We question our spirituality instead of his. You know, we, we question ours instead of relying on his. I heard somebody say once, they were casting a demon out and something happened where a demon had pointed to the fact that they hadn't been fasting. <laughs> and the guy says, well, I bind you in the name of Jesus' fast. So that was pretty good. Yeah. I got done with so. Hey, listen, on your best day, it's only the grace of God. The moment that you showed the most, the strongest measure of faith you've ever known in your life, that was a gift too. It, it all traces back to the, to the gift of God's grace. Absolutely. All right. So let's take a look at these two stories. Oh, I was going to read, I'm sorry, Romans. Let me, let me just take a couple verses just because I want to create the context. First Adam, last Adam, uh, Romans 5, verse 12. Uh, Jesus, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Okay, what's being said here? Adam, first Adam, sinned as a result 
a death sentence was released to all humanity through his one sin, all right? So what's happening here is Paul's talking about the sin of one spread death to all. Got it? Now verse 17 says, if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now, I, I realize that, that's real wordy. Just follow, follow through here. He says, if death reigned through Adam, then even more so life reigns through Jesus Christ to the point where you will reign in life is the phrase he uses. Say that with me, reign in life. It's such a strong biblical term because it is actually the purpose for the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is training for reigning. The book of Proverbs is training to reign in life. Reigning in life is not ruling over people. It is reigning over life. Money doesn't control you. You control money. Relationships don't control you. You don't get depressed because somebody didn't like you on your Facebook page. This is, you're not controlled by the opinions of other people. You manage those things for the glory of God. You manage your own heart for the glory of God and reign in life. It's amazing contrast. The first Adam, death reigned. The last Adam, you reign. I didn't make that up. That's in the book. Now, obviously, we reign in Christ. Not independent of him, but because of him. All right. So let's go to Genesis 1. Let's read that, uh, that uh, story. <clears throat> See, Genesis 3, I mean, sorry. Verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. She added this part, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and when it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees. Verse nine, then God called to Adam and he said, where are you? <clears throat> God asked Adam where he was, not because he didn't know, but because Adam didn't know. When the Lord asks a question, it's different than the enemy. The enemy is always trying to take us into deception and eventually unbelief. Unbelief is partnership with the demonic. <clears throat> when Jesus asks a question, it's always to heighten awareness of what truth is, to lead us into understanding, into revelation, and greater faith. So God asked the question, Adam, where are you? It's interesting though to note that the first temptation in this story was not to eat of the forbidden fruit. It was to question what God said. The serpent came to Adam and Eve and said, has God said? At some point, you have to come to a resolve as a believer. It's critical, the sooner the better. You come to a resolve that I will live with absolute abandonment and trust to the word of God. Yeah. 
Somebody says, well, Bill, there's errors in the Bible. I go, there's not as many errors and errors there is in you. <laughs> First of all, I say there isn't any, but if there is, for conversation's sake, there's not as many in there as there is in you, so I'm not gonna let the bigger error redefine the lesser. It's the only book in existence where the author shows up when you read it. Which I'm really thankful for, because it'd be horrible to be in your bathtub reading a book and have the author show up. Let's, let's be honest, I'm thankful. But the author shows up when you read. You're engaged with a person because it's a living book. It's alive. It's vital to understand that his words actually give life. They, they bring life. One of my favorite stories that I make reference to fairly often is in John 6 where Jesus is teaching. You know, people were enthralled with it, every word that came out of his mouth. I mean, they would, they would say, he teaches like someone with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. And they were always amazed at his words, except for this one sermon where he began to teach, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the people, you know, <laughs> I don't know, they're probably thinking, well, everybody has a bad day, you know, let's... Uh, let's <laughs> <clears throat> so the crowd of perhaps 15,000 leave and Jesus is left with his 12 disciples and he turns to them and he says, are you guys leaving too? Peter has the best answer. He says, where are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. Think through this. Where are we going to go? It, to me, he's saying, all we know, Jesus, we don't understand what you just taught any more than the crowd that left. What we do understand is whenever you talk, we come alive inside. There's life on, there's life on a word you don't understand. That's the whole point. That's why, that's why we come yielded. We come ready to learn. We come ready to be impacted. Has God said was the beginning of the downfall of humanity was to question what the most reliable thing in the universe, and that is God's declarations. <clears throat> I was listening to a, a message on the YouTube, uh, just I think it was last week, uh, by Derek Prince, and he's one of the... Uh, best Bible teachers probably in the last hundred years. Uh, amazing, amazing man. And I'm assuming now he's talking uh, back in the 70s or perhaps the 80s, but he was, he was giving this message. He was talking about a book he had read and he was talking about the uh, persecuted church in China. He was talking about many um, uh, believers who had lost their lives, many who were imprisoned, many who were tortured and beaten. And then this book did a study where they're comparing this group of people with others who had confessed the Lord but had turned in the day of difficulty and had denied the Lord. And this book did a study to compare the two groups. What was the difference? The answer completely shocked me. The common denominator that all of these folks who did well in the face of opposition, the common denominator was they all memorize scripture. They all memorize scripture. It's, it's the John 15, verse seven. If you abide in me, that's the felt realization of his presence and my words abide in you. It's more than just putting to memory verses, but it's allowing the impact of what he says to become you, to shape See, the, the goal isn't for me to be able to give a nice scriptural answer to a question. That's a good beginning. The goal is to become the answer in a sense, to, to have it come forth from me because I'm so, so intimately in, in, uh, intertwined with what God has said. This may sound strange to you, but God wants his word to become flesh again. <clears throat> so the first temptation to Adam and Eve was to question what God said. And anytime there, the, the enemy knows 
some of you are, are too deeply, you've been, you've been at this too long. You're not going to deny the word of God. But perhaps for you, the weak point would be, while you wouldn't ever deny the word of God, you would deny your ability to hear from God. And they are interconnected. And the enemy will always look at the weak point and try to get us shifted from the awareness of I was actually designed to hear from God. Again, it's a gift. It's not like, it's not like I somehow worked hard and arrived at this, at this place of breakthrough. I was designed to hear from the Lord. Everything about me is wired to perceive him from my physical senses to everything about me emotionally, mentally, it's all designed to perceive him. I have to, the, the most obvious thing in the universe is him. You have to work hard to train yourself to ignore him. That's the truth. Look at Luke 4. <clears throat> Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse one, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. <laughs> to be tempted by the devil. Does your Bible just say what I just read? Yeah. The Holy Spirit, the kind, wonderful, generous, gentle, merciful, compassionate Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When the Lord leads you into a conflict, it is never punishment for you. It is always punishment for the devil. The, listen, listen to me carefully. There is no contest between God and the devil. There is not, it's not a contest. It's not worthy of mentioning the two in the same breath. There is no contest. With a word, he can completely demolish and obliterate all powers of darkness. He has chosen to keep them here because they are training ground for you and me who will reign with Christ for eternity. And anytime the Lord leads us into a conflict, it's only because he's equipped us to win. The enemy's only chance is to get us to question what God has said or who we are. <clears throat> Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. In those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. I don't get that at all. <laughs> I've done 40. I was hungry all 40 days. <laughs> In fact, I was hungry before it started, and I was hungry after it ended. I, This is, this is amazing. Afterward, when the 40 was over, he got hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, listen carefully. We are alive because he talks. We live because he speaks. The Bible says he spoke the worlds into being. Let there be light and there was light. He spoke things into being. Secondly, the Bible says that all things are held together by the word of his power. So his abiding, prevailing word actually holds every molecule in place. It's the glue that holds everything in place. 
Thirdly, we know that he sustains us and brings life to us with his voice. Again, back to the, it's the only book you can read that the author shows up when you read it because he sustains us with his word. Paul said in Romans, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say faith comes from hearing the word of God. I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. I'm just saying it's not what it says. If faith came from hearing the word of God, we should all get Bible apps on our phone and just play scripture 24 seven and we'd be like Wigglesworth by Friday (laughs) or Father Abraham or somebody. (laughs) Many people hear the word but never hear the word. They hear and can quote but there's no impact here because the living word has not pierced their soul. Here he says, faith comes by hearing. Doesn't say faith comes from having heard. By implication, it's a present tense encounter, uh, an abiding relationship. Faith comes from, from hearing. It's this abiding in Christ, him abiding in me, his word abiding in me. That connection is what makes me available for faith. I don't need faith for tomorrow's problems today. I have enough challenges today. Staying in the abiding relationship is what keeps me current in faith to address the issues I face now. Faith comes from hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God. tell you a secret for hearing the voice of God. Uh, Just come back next week and uh, we'll... (laughs) Say yes before he commands. If there's a willingness to obey before he speaks, you will attract the voice. And by the way, him speaking to us five, six, seven times about a matter, audible voice, writing on the wall, all the external things is not a sign of our maturity. It's a sign of our immaturity. He wants to lead us, listen carefully, not just with the still small voice, but the Bible says with his eye. The what he gives attention to we give attention to. So the enemy comes to Jesus and the first temptation, now that he's hungry, might appear to turn a stone into bread, but that wasn't really the first temptation. The first temptation was, if you're the son of God. There's nothing the devil could do to persuade Jesus he wasn't the son of God. What he was trying to do is to get him to prove his identity out of an insecurity. We do stupid things. All of us do stupid things when we feel insecure. And it may look really bold. It may look very powerful. But if it comes out of insecurity, it has too much flesh to attract the hand of the Lord. Many things go unfulfilled in our lives because we function out of insecurity. So what was the last thing that the Father spoke to Jesus before this wilderness experience? If you look back just a few verses before, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. Just a few verses before, Jesus is baptized in water. He comes up out of the water and the father speaks, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The enemy will always try to attack the last thing God said to you. 
He can't change who you are. He can just alter your confidence in who you are. Here's, here's the reason behind why I felt to talk to you today about this. <clears throat> I, I'm not one to try to, uh, to try to feed off what the devil is doing to figure out what we're supposed to be doing. I, I don't like that at all. But it doesn't take a genius to realize that the enemy is working hard to really foul up people's identity. And I, I, don't, I'm, I don't say this out of uh, humor or mockery or, you know, with, with any, uh, any malice. It's just, it's just we have a lot of folks and maybe even people that are in the room that have joined with us today who aren't sure of your gender. What once was common sense isn't anymore. Why? Because we've got a culture that started listening to the wrong questions. Has God said, if you're the son of God? It's amazing what aspects and parts of culture that seem so absolute and immovable, how they can be moved if he can just get people that ask the wrong question. See, the enemy's questions don't lead to Jesus. The Lord's questions always lead to encounter, always lead to a place of faith, always lead to a place of encounter. And so the last thing declared over Jesus before this encounter in the wilderness was the Father speaking, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And twice in this series of temptations, the enemy says, if you're the Son of God. I don't know why it surprises us when we have this fresh insight of what God's going to do in our life that that's the first thing to get attacked. It shouldn't surprise us. Well, I thought for sure the Lord said the business would work and I don't know why we're having these problems. <laughs> that's actually why. That's actually why. It's, it's, it's the fully embracing what God has said. Here's the deal. There's a design to our life because of a designer. The designer creates design. Design implies purpose. Purpose implies destiny and destiny requires accountability. If you mess up any of that sequence, you end up with people living for themselves instead of what God had actually intended for planet Earth. And the thing that's being so um, harassed, if you will, in, in culture by seemingly well-meaning people is to question the most simple things in the world. I point to it not for mockery, not for... I mean, obviously, to arm us for prayer. But the more secure you become in who you are, the more you and I leak that sense of identity and purpose into a culture. It's, it's, it's become, become sure of the right things. Become firm in the right things. Number one, you're made in the image of God. Every human being is made in the image of God. Why? For the purpose of relationship. It's the design. Yes. There was no one, no other part of creation that God could fellowship with in the same way that he fellowshiped with Adam and Eve and now with those who are born again. Nothing else even comes close. He celebrates every aspect and part of creation, but only people made in his image, now born again, are created for seamless connection and relationship. You're made in the image of God. And at your worst point, lost in sin, you were worth dying for. That's who you are. You were worth dying for. And your neighbor who doesn't yet know Jesus, he was worth dying for. She was worth dying for. That person you work for, they were worth dying for. Jesus calculated the price and looked at the prize 
And that's worth dying for. And when we embrace that, we don't just embrace fire insurance to not spend eternity in hell. We actually become grafted into a family that has been assigned to be filled with the fullness of God doing greater works than Jesus himself did. There's to be a full manifestation of the triumph of Jesus in the earth every single day of our lives. It's the assignment, it's the design. Has God said, if you're the son of God, those are the two things. I think every temptation issue that we face in life falls into one of those two categories, either questioning what God said or questioning who he says you are. You were designed to be a part of a people, a chosen race, chosen not because we're better. In fact, God tended to choose things that were less. <laughs> yeah, I didn't choose you because of your strength. I chose you because of your weakness. Well, how do I brag about that? Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> that's the point. He chose us as a people, a chosen race, every one, regardless of your natural race. We are a chosen race, according to scripture, together. Sons and daughters of the king, a new creation, which means a creation, something created that has never existed before for the purpose of illustrating who Jesus is until the earth is filled with the glory of God. The target of the Lord is the earth is filled with the glory of God. And it's through an obedient, surrendered people that live for his purposes, that live under the glory of his name. This is the privilege of life. And there's just two things we anchor our soul to. One is what did God say? And two, who am I? What has he declared about me? In the case with Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. <clears throat> I remember watching my boys play baseball. I'd be in the stands and one of them would make a great play and I'd stand up in the middle of that crowd and I'd say, whose son is that? <laughs> That's his delight over you. If you forget it, you'll get weird. If you forget it, you'll make stupid decisions. Evil things only become appealing to a people who forgot who they are. A step. All right, all right, all right. Oh, Jesus. Help us, help us. Here's the, the, the thing I want to pray the most. I'm going to start at one thing. I want everyone in this room to know who God says we are. Yeah. That's all. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Or my version. Whose son is that? Whose daughter is that? There's something so engaging about seeing his delight over us. Not here, here. The deep realization, you were not chosen as a part of a group. You were chosen by name. And he delights in you. So Father, 
I pray in the weeks to come, this would become clearer and clearer for the honor of the name Jesus. Amen. Let me ask one more question before I, I turn it over. I want to know, is there anybody in the room that you have never committed your life to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, to surrender your life to him is a term that we use. If there's anybody in here that would say, that's me, I want to know Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him. It may be somebody on, uh, online. Let somebody know in the chat room what you're doing right now. If there's anybody in the room that's in that position, put your hand up right now and just say, that's me. I don't want to leave the place until I know I have been forgiven and I have found peace with God. Anybody at all, real quick. Okay, I'm going to assume you're all in then. Come on up and wrap it up for us.